Let's hear from God. Please stand with me for the reading of Psalm chapter 42, or book 40. Well, yeah, Psalm 42. How about that? We're going to read 42 and 43. Um, just a little reasoning behind that. I started studying 42, and then I looked at next week, 43. I thought, man, five verses, that ought to be short. And then the commentator said, yeah, these were one psalm. And I was like, oh, come on, they're not one. And then they really were. Um, you, you read them, and it's very clear. There's a refrain in verse uh, 5, and I believe it's 11 or 12, 11, the, the end of chapter 42, or book 42, um, chapter 42. And then the last verse of 43 it's the same thing. So you, you see this, this crying out to God, and then he says, May my but hope in the Lord, my soul. Crying out to God, and he says, But hope in the Lord, my soul. And then chapter 43 repeats the same thing, crying out to God, but hope in the Lord, my soul. You see this clear pattern that takes shape, some repetition. And uh, so I believe they were either written in one sitting and separated at some point. Um, they said actually the the Mishnah or one of the rabbinical writings actually only accounts for 147 psalms. So they combine three of them so that you go from 150 down to there's only 147. And these are two of the psalms that they combine into one. With that being said, let me read to you from God's word. I invite you to read along with me. Um, if you brought your copy of God's word, uh, I commend you for that. I put the words up on the screen. Um it's okay to read those as well, but it's also good to have your own scriptures to take notes or use um, the, the binders that we have. If you would like one of the, the little binders with the sheets that come out each week, let us know. We can purchase you one of those. But I encourage you just to jot down thoughts because one of the things we're going to see today is that what is absolutely critical in the life of the Christian is to read the Word of God and to meditate on it, to think upon it, to dwell upon it, not just to sit and listen and then walk away but to do the work of the church, to feast upon the word of God. So let us hear now the words of the Lord from Psalm 42. To the choir master, a masculine of the sons of Korah, as the deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God, when shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all the day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would, I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Miser, Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love. And at night, his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me while, it, while they say to me all the day long, where, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people. From the deceitful and unjust man, deliver me. For you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go about mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God 
to God my exceeding joy. And I will praise you with a lyre, O my God, my God. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. For I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. This ends the reading of God's word. Amen and amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the heartfelt, passionate cries of this psalmist. May we feel it today. May we hear it. May we be changed by it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. We continue through the summer of Psalms. And today we're looking at Psalm 42 and 43, and I promise you, there is hope for thirsty souls. Have you ever been in a spiritual drought? What did that feel like? There's different levels. You might go, so it's kind of splashing around in some low water, but I went in a drought did you doubt during that time the historic Christian teachings of the church? Did you question your own personal faith in God or in Christ? Did you feel farther from God? <coughs> Just something wasn't right. Did you feel like you wanted to leave the church? Did you feel like, I don't know why I'm here, what I'm doing. I'm not interested. I'm dissatisfied. And I, and I don't even know if I'm satisfied. I'm not. I'm just here. There's a song on the, on, um, well, I was going to say the radio, but who listens to that anymore? Um, it's called Numb Little Bug. And I don't know if it's a good song or not. I just remember the little t- chorus talking about, or the song talking about, I feel like I'm just numb, just walking through life. Is that what you feel like when you're in that spiritual drought? Maybe during this time that you're either going through now that you've passed through in the past or something that may be coming up in your future. Did you soften your views on God's demands on your life? So as you as you felt that you weren't really close to God, but you didn't realize you weren't close to God, you just knew that I don't feel the same way about his teachings. Perhaps you were following friends who claimed to have found some fresh water. A new way. Something interesting that piqued your interest and and it, it claimed to be the thing that you needed to restore life, to feel close to God again, only to find that their ways led you to stinky pond of stagnant water that had no life in it and here you were lapping up from a filthy pond of death perhaps you're feeling spiritually parched today perhaps life has created a smoke screen hiding God from you and maybe it's not as deep and 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 passionate as as I'm describing here for you. Maybe you're still on the on the verge of this, and you just don't feel quite right. But you know, you just don't see God as clearly. You see, we are not naturally able to stay near to God, but we're born separated from Him. We're born divided from him. We're born disconnected from him. We're born fallen into sin. We know this. Our theology tells us this. But many of us came to Christ at a young age, and we don't remember and really understand what it feels like to be completely separated from God. Even as a young age, when you um, are, may not have come to full faith and knowledge and understanding of Christ, who knows when he regenerated you, and you might have grown up in a Christian family that you got the common grace of the gospel, so things felt good. 
You had a loving father. Happy Father's Day, by the way. I forgot to say that at the beginning. You had a loving mother. That doesn't describe everybody. I get that. Sometimes you mention father and people go, oh, I don't want another father like that. But when it's a godly father and a godly mother, you, you may not have experienced that spiritual dryness. But it's there for all of us on some level when we're born. This is the reason Christ tells us you must be born again. You must be brought out of spiritual death into spiritual life. And we go, good, I'm free. Everything here will be perfect and happy. And everybody who's a little bit older, a little, a little bit of life, <coughs> goes, that's not the way it works. You pass on your journeys through the desert at times. Sometimes you brought it on yourself. Sometimes the Lord allowed it to come upon you. And this natural inability to come to God ourselves lingers with us even after we are born again by faith. I've left that behind, but Paul says it's like an old, the old man's like grabbing. I just always, I, I don't even know if this is what Paul had in his mind, but I pictured like this old like cloak trying to put itself on you, death trying to grab you and pull you back, and you're fighting it. But every once in a while it grabs a hold of you, and it takes you into spiritual dryness. Notice I didn't say death. You can't die again if you're a child of God. He's promised, I will leave you, nor I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will lose none of the sheep. The Father has given me. I will go out and look for the one out of the hundred that's lost. I will not lose my sheep. So we have that hope. But our souls can thirst for God. David, in this psalm, was spiritually parched. Now you go, I thought it was the psalm for the sons of Korah. Calvin handles that. Others disagree with Calvin. You know my stance, unless I can prove Calvin wrong, I like what he's, no, I actually believe he's, he's correct here. What he says made a lot of sense. He believes this is a Psalm of David and that the sons of Korah were the, you know, Korah was one of the ones, I believe that was swallowed up by the, the earth, kind of said, um, he said, he's offered strange fire and the earth go, <laughs> swallowed him up. I don't even know what that looked like, but everybody went, whoa, not going to do that. His sons weren't swallowed up. And they were the Levitical priests that had very great gifts and music and singing and leading in worship. And so the sons of Korah, this psalm that would have been given to them, there are a series of psalms from the sons of Korah. And Calvin argues that this was penned by David and they they own, they managed it for him. They used it. They, they sang it. Um, now, others argue the exact opposite and said this probably was written after the times of David. Do what you will with it. Um, it's easier to say David, and I usually say David when I'm talking about Psalms even anyways because it just flows out of the mouth. But it fits his life, right? He was on the run from Saul. He was on the run from Absalom. He was on the run from his family. He was on the run from and, and charging after <coughs> nations that wanted to destroy the kingdom of Israel. He was a warrior, and at times he would cry out, My soul thirsts for God. Because he was far from God. And his only pleading in verse 2 was, When shall I come and appear again before the presence of my God? How do we get back to God when we are spiritually dry? David explains his thirst like that of a deer in verse 1, panting for flowing streams. Calvin, in, in his commentary, and the, and the guy that translated it that together, they said um, that deer, I'm not a deer expert, so forgive me if I get this wrong, but that they will bark. Um, and they said one of the things is this, this picture here, the, the word um, panting, is, it comes from this word of it being inclined. Uh, I don't. I don't. But they, they, the one of the commentators follows the etymology of the word, but it's this idea of just, oh, I need water. I need uh, crying out because of of hunting desperately for a stream that is not dried up, going from stream to stream. I, I'm parched. I'm being chased by a hunter. Maybe I need life giving water. David wants to be in the presence of God. He wants 
that life giving flowing streams of water, not the stagnant pools of death and dry waterbeds. And, and Calvin highlights here, he says, look, one of, the, one of the guiding principles of this is not that this deer picture is that he's inclined reaching up to heaven because Calvin says, God doesn't come near to us by bringing us to heaven. He condescends to us. That's the beauty of God. That's the beauty of the Christian religion. All other religions say you must work yourself to the deity. And Christianity says you can't. I will come to you. I will bring waters to you. I will come down to you. And no one comes to the Father, but through Christ who descended to us. And no one comes to Jesus Christ unless the Father draws him. You start to see this idea that how do we return to God? The first guiding principle that we have to understand, it's not that if you work really, 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 really hard, then you're going to find your way to God. It's that God woos us by His Spirit, whether we are coming out of spiritual death or spiritual drought. You think about it, what's the difference between coming to Christ for salvation and coming to Christ to feed and feast? The only difference is this is your first experience. And it's like, wow. But it's still the same God, the same, the wooing. He pulls us, he draws us, he pulls us into it. Both involve returning a lost sheep to the sheepfold. Either I'm coming for the first time into the sheepfold and realizing my people, I've finally found home, or I'm being brought back to return to that which I've left, the safety and comfort of God. And in each situation, it is a work of God's spirit. And when David was drowning in the waves of spiritual despair, it, it talked about waterfalls. <laughs> and one of the commentators said, you know, we picture waterfalls, but they said what was really common in that area over there were water spouts and just gushes of water and the waves crashing in. And David's picturing this, this, this idea of just all of this massive amount of water crashing in upon him. And when he felt that spiritual despair, that drought of not being near to God, he did this. He continually reminded himself of one thing, hope in God. There you go, well, you could have said that at the beginning, right? We could have gone home. I know that one. We're good. Yeah, but did you, in your time of spiritual drought, is that where you were? Hoping in God? Sometimes. But it's harder and harder the further and further we are away from the Lord. And on top of that, he had adversaries. You know, David had thousands and hundreds of thousands probably of adversaries. Maybe not hundreds of thousands. That's a lot. But he had people and nations against him. And what were they saying? Where is your God now? This God you keep talking about, where is he? Tell him to come get you. Hey, you have been run out of your land. You're no longer king right now. Your son has taken over or you're, you're supposed to become king and Saul's chasing you down and all these various things. Where is your God, David? You said he came to you when you were a shepherd in the field, but he's left you. He's left you. Reminds me of the story of Abraham. I was watching something yesterday and it is, he offered his only son, Isaac. And, and if people knew what Abraham was doing, what, where, who is your God? Why would you follow such an, a, 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 a God that demands something so uh, ungodly to sacrifice your own son? There are things that God commands us to do and, and the world thinks them foolish and they cry out to us, where is your God? And they pile on and it only serves to make us drier and drier. And during this time, David told his soul in this psalm, hope 
in God. And he said it three times. Hope in God. Hope in God. Verses 5 and 11 of chapter 42 and verse 5 of chapter 43. I believe David's doing this as this psalmist. One, because what song isn't good without a refrain and a chorus, right? That's why he wrote it. Uh, this, these were song, songs that were sung in the temple, though. And, and what David wants everybody to understand is life goes on. Life crashes around you. The water's crashing down. You feel far from God. But you must remember that your only hope and your salvation out of all of this is rooted in God. It, that a single sip of water will not get you through a marathon. So David repeats this over and over and over again. He's seeking to return to God. How is it that he enters into the presence of God? There's one thing to turn back. It's another thing now to run and, and come into the presence of God. Well, how does God woo us out of this spiritual drought? Well, consider how the deer finds water. He runs to and fro from babbling, listening, looking for babbling brooks, and he finally finds one, right? Yet every step, our theology would tell us, is led by the providence of God. The deer ran, the deer hunted, the deer listened, the deer sought, but God guided each and every step along the way. We seek out God. But God, Calvin rightly explains to us that it is God who descends to us. This is the love of God, that he doesn't leave us like a slug on the concrete drying out, but that he comes to us when we cannot move to him. He comes to us when we have no hope. But how? Because Jesus condescended to save us, but then he's been resurrected. He ascended back to heaven. And you may and you hear stories of, oh, God is everywhere. It's true. But Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. He took on flesh. Flesh isn't everywhere. Jesus, the son of God who took on flesh is in heaven. So how is it that he descends to us and he meets with us and he helps us? Well, David instructs us here when he says in verse four, uh, he talks about, I remember these things. And what does he remember? I remember leading the throng of God's people to worship. He's, he's far off in a foreign land. And he says, I remember the days he's writing. I just, I'm reflecting on it. And I remember the joy of, of going into worship, going into the tabernacle, going into <coughs> to meet God, seeing the priests, seeing the sacrifices, seeing the entire system that was set up for me to know that God was dwelling in the midst of his people. He's writing from verse six beyond the Jordan. Um, it, it, he said uh, in the land of the Jordan, this would have been this idea that, you know, the, the eastern uh, uh, demarcation of the land of Israel would have been the Jordan River. That was what they had to cross. You remember the second parting of the waters? They parted the, the, the Jordan and they walked through and they stood there with the Ark of the Covenant to, to let the waters recede while the people passed through. Some of the Israelites stayed on the other side, but essentially the other side was considered to be land that was not part is not in God's land is not in the chosen land, the promised land. And David had fled and he's fleeing across the mountaintops. He's hiding. He's, he's hiding from people that are chasing him. And he says, I remember the days when I wasn't running, when I wasn't hiding. David reflects on the festivals that once excited his soul, the joys of people flooding into Jerusalem and Pilgrims from all over the place coming to worship God on high. They would sing the song of ascents as people ascended up to Jerusalem to worship the Lord. He says, I remember in the second part of verse 4, the voices of, of joy and the voices of thanksgiving that were among the multitude there. He, his soul was encouraged by the loudness, the, 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 the unity of it all as he was drawn into the presence of God and even led others there himself. And David's soul pants for participation in the outward 
signs of grace. Because he says, I want you, God. But then he says, but I remember when we did these activities. Is it Was David earning his way and, and getting favor with God to bring God down? What was, what was going on there? In the Old Testament, in the days of David, the tabernacle, the priesthood, the sacrifices, the festivals, the Sabbaths, these were a system that God put in place. They were definitely rungs of a ladder that you could climb, but it was, it was God's means of drawing his people into his presence. It was, it was the means of grace. The ordinary way that you went before a holy God in Israel was you went covered in the blood sacrifice of the animals. You went at these appointed times. God, this was the system that God set up. And David said, look, I want the face of God. And the only way that I know to get before the face of God is to utilize the means which God has given to us to approach him. So when we think about entering into the presence of God, we think about our spiritual drought. We got to remember, it's not God that has moved. It is us. God's spirit is here among us. God's spirit lives in each and every one of his children. But we may not feel it. We may not experience it in the same manner every day, every week, every month, or every year. Spiritual drought is caused by our retreat, not God's. For David, the ceremonial law that he was remembering in these festivals, these were not mere suggestions. Hey, Israel, you should do these things. They're really beneficial. They'll make you feel religious. They'll make you feel good. They'll make you feel comfortable. They'll, they'll make you have a unity of mind. No, David explains <clears throat> that these were absolute necessities for approaching God and for nearness to God. He explains that his absence from these things are what led him to the spiritual drought that he's experiencing. He says in verse four, <clears throat> I remember worshiping with my people. I remember going up and I, I'm remembering all these things. And then in verse five, he immediately says, and I will do that again. He says, I will praise God again. And what he's trying to get us to understand is you got to remember David's position. He is, he's been promised by God that he will be king. He's been promised that he will be, uh, there will be one who sits on his throne forever. So at some point in this story, David pins this, psalm and it's as though david is or it's exactly like david is telling us that hey i am parched but i know god's going to restore me because he's promised me and how will he restore me he'll draw me back into him with the means that he has designed for this very purpose see god's promised David he would have someone on his throne forever. And these ceremonies, these festivals were intimately connected to God's work of keeping David near him. It was God's design for how he would descend to Israel. What happened when they, they had the sacrificial system? The priest once a year would go into the Holy of Holies and God would descend to the Holy of Holies. And when the tabernacle was packed up and went, God went before them as a pillar of fire by day and a cloud or a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He was their rear and front guard. But when they turned on him, what does it say? It says the Shekinah glory of God left the temple. It didn't leave the land. It left the temple because God's means of descending to them was to go into the temple and to surround himself with a, a ceremonial means of cleansing the people before they came to him. Now, the blood and bulls and goats never accomplished anything. It didn't cleanse them, but it was God's ceremonial way to communicate to them that they needed to be cleansed to approach a holy and high God. If you were going to approach God, you must come to God by his means and his means alone. So, 
these ceremonies, these sacrifices in Christ have been fulfilled. We no longer need a bloody sacrifice. Jesus was the final sacrifice. His meeting place with us is no longer the temple. We don't need for a temple to be rebuilt in Israel. For those that are waiting on that, it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Do you not know, church of God, you are the temple of God. The Spirit of God dwells in you. you. Peter describes it as you are living stones being built up into a spiritual temple. So God descends and meets us in ourselves each and every day. Our bodies are the temple. It is much more intimate. It is much more personal. And how does he communicate with us? You don't hear a little voice. He doesn't, you don't dream dreams. The ordinary means by which God communicates to us ensures us of his promises, upholds us in the strength of faith is by his word that is given to us, preached, proclaimed, and read, prayers offered for us and by us, we communicate with God, and the sacraments which communicate to us the graciousness of God. This is the system, the ceremonial system of the New Testament. And we go, yeah, but God's not about forcing us to do all these things and have all these laws and making us earn our way to heaven. David never thought the ceremonial system was earning his way to heaven. He just knew that this was the prescribed way to overcome his spiritual drought. I am far from you, God, and jo over the Jordan. I would like to be back near to you, God, where you are dwelling. So when God dwells in us and we quench the voice of his spirit, we feel spiritually parched and dry. The ceremonial law of the Old Testament was not an optional way to get to God. It was the way that God communicated to his church, them, the prophets, the system there. The ordinary means of grace here in the New Testament, the word of God, the preaching of the word, the reading of the word, prayer and the sacraments, they're not optional. They are the only way that God communicates to his church. The only way that you will hear from God, that you will hear his voice. You go, but his spirit lives within me, right? And as the word is preached, his spirit says, that is true. You're falling short in this area. Well done over here. Keep up the good work. The Spirit works within you to, to confirm the message that is preached and proclaimed of the things you're reading. Neglect and inconsistency in the spiritual disciplines and the means of grace leads us into spiritual drought. It's like running a marathon and getting to every water station, just waving them off. I'm feeling good. I, I had some back there. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. What will eventually happen is that we'll have a negative impact. You will dry out. You will not finish the race. God offers a water station each and every week. God offers a water station each and every day. He says, I will come and I live in you. Oh, so often we're just kind of going, God, I'm good today. I'm too busy today. I've got to catch that guy up in front of me during this race. I can't stop and slow down to drink water. I'll get some later. And we're waving off the spiritual means by which God communicates to us. And then we turn around one day and go, what happened? I'm dry. I'm far from God. I can't even see him. There's been a smoke screen set up. I don't know where he is. I don't know where to look. God, why did you leave me? He says, I didn't. I didn't. You see, David, the reason he was in a foreign land, he wasn't traveling. He wasn't on vacation. He wasn't going to see the sights. He wasn't off skiing. I wonder if they had any kind of skiing at all back then. No, they didn't. He wasn't doing those things. He was running from his enemies. His enemies forced him into a situation that disconnected him from the means and the ordinary common means of gracious communication from God in the presence of God. <coughs> David felt it, and he longed for God to, to bring him back. This is true of us, too, and we don't realize it. The enemy cannot kill you. So 
He wants to make us miserable. And what better way to do that than to give us excuses? How many excuses are in your head of why you didn't read the Bible every single day this week? And don't look at me and go, well, pastor, I need to be more like you. Please don't be more like me. Go way beyond me. I promise you, this is as convicting to me as any of us in this room. And we hear it and we go, oh, man, another sermon about reading my Bible. I just want to know how to get close to God. (laughs) Therein lies the problem. The further we are from God, the less we want to hear the word of God and believe the word of God. And he tells us, this is how I descend to you. We begin to believe those sweet tasting lies that only quench the voice of God. I'm too busy today. Man, I had to get up early. I'm too, every time I read, I fall asleep. I don't understand that King James version. I can't understand a word it says. We'll get you a new version. We come up with excuses and we believe they're our excuses. We begin to believe they're good excuses of why we attend the worship and the gathering of God's people just every so often. But they're really the the lies of the evil one convincing you that you don't need this, that you don't need the word of God, that you don't need to pray. There's no value in it. It's not really helping you. You don't need that water right now. I'll get it later. And God says, I've set this up so that you say, stay hydrated. You stay moist and and enjoying the things of me. Why? Why are you in despair? Oh, my soul. Why am I so disturbed? Because the refrain of this world has drowned out the refrain of the Spirit, which is hope in God. Hope in God. Hope in God. Because just like David has a promise that he would be on, he would have his offspring on the throne forever, that he would be restored, he would be king of Israel, we have a promise. That no matter what we're going through, whether it be in this life or the next, we have this promise, I shall praise Him again. You will not be lost. You will not be forsaken. You are a child of God. The means of grace are not burdensome. They're His means to descend to you, to feed us, to help us, to love us. For he, David says, is the help of my countenance. And he is my God. Let's pray. Father, lift our countenances today. Pull us, dragging us, God, from the spiritual drought that has beset us. Let us use the means that you've given us to come to you, to return to you, to be fed by you, O God. Please help us to stop thinking of these activities as mere optional things that really good Christians do and realize that they are the lifeblood of the Christian. Help us to to believe that, O God. We pray this in Jesus' name.